Hi. Million Concepts is a consulting company that specializes in research support. The product we're talking about today is the Aresian Lens, a novel imaging element that enables compact, low-mass, high-powered microscopy. A vast amount of information can be learned about objects by observing them at scales less than a micron, which is a hundred times less than the width of a human hair. It is also expensive and difficult to make these observations. A laboratory-grade compound microscope system capable of resolving such structures generally weighs over 10 kilograms and costs thousands of dollars. Our technology can functionally replace these microscopes in many applications with a system that weighs around 150 grams, costs about $100, and can be smaller than an inch-long length of drinking straw. The Aresian lens was a side effect of research into high-precision radial velocity telescopy by researchers at the Pennsylvania State University, and specifically the habitable zone planet finder, which is the most precise radial velocity imaging instrument in the world and promises to soon dramatically increase the number of targets in the search for extraterrestrial life. I'm showing you a picture of a couple of the interior components of the HPF and that is because the outside looks boring. This is the entire HPF being delivered to McDonald Obser Observatory in Texas. The Aresian lens is a very small optical component of the imaging chain contained in this very large box. During instrument development, the inventors realized that it had microscopic as well as telescopic applications, and Million Concepts has partnered with them to explore paths to market. The past decade has seen a lot of innovation in low-cost portable microscopy. This is due primarily to smartphones and secondarily to new materials and manufacturing techniques for optical components. Some of these innovations have been commercialized, although most of them are still laboratory prototypes primarily described in academic journals. But commercial examples include blips, foldscope, eye microscope, cell scope, and dot lens. The most common target application for both commercial and non-commercial versions of these products has been point-of-care medical testing. This is a photograph of human blood taken at about 400 times magnification with an effective resolution of about 2 microns. This is approximately the resolving power of existing low-cost portable microscopy solutions. You can see that this is adequate for counting cells but it is not adequate for resolving cell structures. These are shots of human blood taken through an Aresian lens prototype operating at, operating at approximately 800 times magnification with resolution of better than one micron. If you ever look at path lab slides, these look weird because they are stained with pen ink, which is not a normal medical slide preparation. This is because the inventors are not pathologists, they are astronomers and pen ink is what they had lying around. Here's a detail of that previous image, and next to it, a shot of a lab-grade compound microscope operating at a similar magnification. You can see that the Aresian lens microscope does introduce some distortion. It's not as good as the lab-grade microscope, but again, it's 90% the ma less mass and 90% less cost. Here's another set of biological images taken through an early Aresian lens prototype at lower mag. We suspect that we can push this technology to produce magnification of better than a thousand times without loss of effective resolution, but these prototypes have not yet been developed. So, what do we do with this excellent technology? Lots of things, but most of them will not make money. For instance, you can do serious blood diagnostics with an Aresian lens, but we're pretty sure that everyone who needs to do serious blood diagnostics and has the buying power to form a viable market segment already has a lab-grade compound microscope and a place to put it. So we've targeted education as an excellent bootstrap market for Aresian lens microscope systems. Why? Well, first of all, education is an enormous market. Global higher ed alone is a roughly $2 trillion market that is larger than all of healthcare. 
We are, of course, thinking more narrowly about technology spend in higher ed in the US. And this is a harder market to calculate because market analysts segment it in really weird ways. School supplies are different than e-textbooks, are different than IT services, are different than assessment software. But we can guesstimate a market size there of about 25 billion. And in any case, this is a lot of market surface to target. You may have noticed that I am talking about higher education. And this is because we have a specific starting niche in mind. We have done customer discovery that suggests that the lens would appeal to a variety of market segments in the education market, from life science educators in public school settings to nonprofits doing STEM education in underserved communities. But our first target segment is online higher education. This is a really appealing target market for discrete pieces of equipment because you have a steady stream of students who each purchase a unit every semester and have limited opportunity for development of secondary markets. This has the potential to provide us with a stable income supply without significant additional cost for product development. Furthermore, the prototypes already developed by the Penn State team are extremely close to an MVP for this market, as demonstrated by the blood slide stained with pen ink that you saw earlier. This commercialization approach is really close to the e-textbook model, which is keeping college textbook spend at $12 billion a year, even while publication in general has crashed. Now, why would higher ed institutions want to incorporate a Norwegian lens microscope into their curriculum? Okay, so online education is inexpensive and flexible, but it has its own challenges and one of them is providing hands-on lab experience to students. There are subjects for which pretty good labs in a box are available. These are kits that students order, they're shipped to them, they open them up, they do some experiments in accordance with the curriculum, some kind of information is sent back to educators for assessment, and hopefully we know now that the student has some hands-on experience with, say, chemical reagents. However, Microbiology is not presently taught in this way, which prevents many online institutions from offering degree equivalent microbiology courses, which means that we cannot have degree equivalent courses in allied health sciences, pre-medicine, and other very important fields. And the reason for this is that to teach microbiology well, students need to be able to visualize real cells. You cannot make every student buy and maintain a $1,000 compound microscope. You also can't make use of existing compact low-cost microscopy solutions because they're not good enough. But ours is. Now, as I was saying, this is a bootstrap market. Given STEM education is a sufficiently large market, that commercial success there would be an unqualified win but we are still interested in using it to move into even higher impact and profit, but also higher barrier to entry domains. The Aresian lens is a very promising technology for use in space missions, because space hates mass, and the Aresian lens offers an enormous mass budget savings over traditional microscopes. We have identified one application for the Aresian lens in the, a promising area in commercialization of low Earth orbit protein crystal growth for biopharmaceutical research. Since the 1980s, the continuing development of biologics, protein-based drugs produced through recombinant DNA technologies, has revolutionized medicine. They have hugely expanded medicine's ability to treat syndromes from arthritis to lymphoma. But the pipeline has started to dry up, and we may soon stop easily discovering new biologics. Growing high-quality crystals of candidate proteins, this is porcine elastase, a pig stretchiness controlling compound, is one important R&D bottleneck. And crystals grow much better in microgravity because gravity is not there ruining their crystal structure. Recent economic studies commissioned by NASA indicate that this kind of pharma R&D is the most promising area for commercialization of low Earth orbit one of the most practical routes. This is the present standard for optical experiments in microgravity. 
It's called the Light Microscopy Module, and it is centered around a commercial off-the-shelf Leica microscope. It performs very well, but as you can see, it's heavy and bulky, and you can't just stick a whole bunch more of them on the space station. For this reason, the vast majority of existing crystal growth experiments in microgravity occur in these densely packed, sealed environments. You ship them up, you bring them back down to Earth, and only examine the crystals once you can open them back up in a terrestrial environment. Without continuous monitoring of these environments, it's really difficult to determine what factors might have affected the resultant crystal quality. A region lens microscope systems could provide the continuous monitoring that's necessary without very much modification at all to existing mass payload budgets. Furthermore, the characteristics of the region lens that make it an excellent solution for smartphone microscopy allow you to take almost any verified imaging chain and turn it into a microscope. This is great for space. For instance, it could be selectable by filter wheel on hand lens imagers like the MOLLE, which is a microscopic imager currently in use on the Mars Science Laboratory. A lot of interesting geology and potentially even exobiology take place at the micron scale. For instance, Martian microfossils might only be recognizable at a one micron level. One of the things we like most about this is that it brings space science to the market and from there back into a different part of space science. A whole lot of commercially viable technologies stay stuck in the lab, and this prevents them from realizing their full scientific potential. Lots of optimization happens in the market that does not happen in research environments. In fact, the market is a crowdsourced R&D environment of its own. I'm gonna close with an introduction to our team. These are the Aresian Lens inventors, Suvrath Mahadevan, Arpita Roy, and Sam Halverson. Dr. Mahadevan is a world leader in telescope optics and exoplanet discovery research. Dr. Roy currently holds the prestigious Robert R. Milliken postdoctoral position in experimental physics at Caltech. And Sam Halverson is performing postdoctoral work at UPenn on exoplanet discovery. Their expertise is going to be very valuable in ongoing R&D efforts. And this is the primary commercialization team. That's Chase Million over there. He's an astronomer and an engineer with special expertise in image processing for remote sensing and astronomy. And I'm a technologist and researcher with expertise in design and educational technology. Thank you for listening to me, and I am open to questions. Thank you. Thank you, that was a great presentation. Thank you. One question I have, um, so you mentioned that your microscope system is lighter. Mm -hmm. Can you please explain um, the size and scope and material so we can get a picture of what it would look like? Uh, so there are various form factors that the optical system itself could be placed into, but for instance, one prototype and uh, a form factor that's similar to what we'd probably use for the education market can be a simple clip or assembly that fits right over a smartphone lens. That's how small it could be. For applications like the space science applications I'm describing, it would probably be slightly larger and consist of an array of several lenses along with a system, like a system on a chip for in situ computer vision processing. You didn't say anything about the materials. How would they handle, handle survive in a, a cold temperature or radiation environment or? So there are a variety of materials that we think can be used to produce this optical system that have been space tested. The current materials being used for prototypes have not, and further prototyping and research is necessary to determine that. How stable is the image? If you focus on something, can you, is it stable for a long period of time? Uh, it's as stable as your stabilization system, like most optical microscopes. There's nothing intrinsic about the region lens itself that introduces additional jitter. Uh, one of the um, things that's problematic in the developing world 
is when you're trying to make a cultural difference to uh, indigenous peoples yeah. who don't believe that there are tiny little animals in the water mm -hmm. that could hurt them. And have you thought about the fact that this actually, the, the show, me, show me and tell, show and tell to those peoples could be quite uh, a cultural change to them in like boiling water or something like that, which some cultures consider only for old people? That is absolutely a possible application for the lens. We do not necessarily consider that a viable market segment, but this and other portable low-cost microscopy solutions have been used in a variety of developing world initiatives for both public health and point-of-care applications. Adoption has generally not been high. The other question I had on the protein crystal growth uh, in Leo, that is, uh, that's a, a subject dear to my heart, and I'm, I was just wondering, could you just expand a little bit on that, what you think that could be done, like on ISS or something like that? Yes. So there are already ongoing protein crystal growth experiments on ISS. Uh, I don't remember the acronyms right now, but there are a couple of densely packed protein growth environments that consist of a variety of sealed cells that, again, compounds are introduced into on Earth, they're shipped up into low Earth orbit, they're held there in a temperature-controlled way for a certain period of time, brought down and examined upon return to Earth. However, there are a lot of factors that can influence the quality of crystal growth in these environments that can't be seen. For instance, there could be a local failure of stabilization that leads to a high degree of jitter within one or more cells that strongly reduces the quality of the resultant crystal. This could be easily confused by the biopharmaceutical research customer for a fundamental lack of viability of this protein. If we had continuous monitoring through very small, lightweight microscopes, we could determine that this had been an experimental failure rather than a fundamental failure in the quality of the protein. This would both allow us to push things through the pipeline more quickly and, in fact, encourage adoption of the low Earth orbit environment by biopharmaceutical customers. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So if I understand your concept or the current stage, um, you are just the optical front end for a, a, other cameras. Which camera or camera lines or, or partners are you looking to partner with for the actual camera itself? We are still in the search phase for both customers and applications beyond the education market and some of the, the stretch regions we're talking about. Um, the system can potentially be coupled to almost any commercial camera or there are at least, there are apparatuses that could allow the system to be coupled to almost any commercial camera. Which cameras would be useful would depend on the application. It seems like this is something that could be readily reproduced by a fast follower. What differentiate your technology? What IP protection do you have? There is a peppers? patent pending currently on the technology. Can you talk about what the nature of that is or do you want to wait till it's uh, disposition? Uh, I'd rather wait we'll until that's disposition in this. We could talk about it privately, yeah. So you might say that Canon cameras might be just saying. For instance, like Canon cameras would be excellent imaging chains to terminate with an Aurasian lens. Yes. Uh, so, Michael, one, one quick question that has uh, two components. So. Do you envision that uh, this lens, that you're going to achieve enough accuracy so that if I am, let's say, a surgeon mm -hmm. in the operating room and mm -hmm. I'm trying to remove a tumor mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that I clear the edges um, mm -hmm. so that there's no remaining tumor in the patient, that I would theoretically be able to do that with this lens in some sort of camera in almost real time as long as the stains are done appropriately. It could be exactly real time if it were being used to terminate a fiber fed endoscope um, or at least at the speed of light. Um, so yes, the Aurasian lens absolutely could be used in healthcare settings, both point of care and in like deeper clinical settings. Uh, we don't necessarily consider this a viable first market because the barriers to entry are very, very high. We have been approached by people who, both clinicians and biomedical researchers, who have interest in our device, and we're 
interested in finding partners to explore those applications. But you would need to do further development on the accuracy so that whenever you look at an image, you can say this is a normal cell versus an abnormal cell. Or do you think that you're there now? Depending on what types of cells we were attempting to image, for instance, if we were looking for particular kinds of dysplasias, there might be specific computer vision techniques and imaging stacks we would need to build. And then the second component of that, you know, not every country has access to the microbiology grade microscopes, right? It is so there true. are rural uh, places and then certainly other countries. So do you see an application in that setting for rapid diagnostics? You know, I'm thinking about malaria or other uh, type of diseases that could benefit in um, resource poor uh, countries? There are absolutely applications in such areas for research poor countries. Uh, we can easily image malarial parasites, for instance, yes. Hi. Um, I mean, it's very hard for me to make your question because uh, I think, you know, you have a great storyboard, but it's a great storyboard. I mean, I didn't mm. see a number of data. It's very mm. inspirational, right? I mean, I aspire to go to Mars. Mm. You know, I can deliver a great story, but if I don't explain exactly how, um, it's hard then to rifle you with some uh, challenging questions. But I still don't get what problem you are solving. You know, to me, uh, innovation generally either create a problem that doesn't exist today. Mm. I mean, uh, would people care about Uber before Uber, mm. right? Uh, or the iPhone? Mm. Uh, or uh, they are addressing an existing problem and then just make it better. Mm. Uh, which is also the Uber case. I mean, uh, so what is the problem that you are uh, fixing and how you're fixing? You, I mean, you just come out with a better lens uh, that is better than uh, any microscope around. And so back to that comment, you know, this I can read the canon behind, you know, just below where you. So, I mean, what a better pitch, what a better lead, right? Um, yeah, I'm interested in really in the problem, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you pitch someone uh, in an elevator and uh, that, that gentleman, let's say, will be the gentleman that, that the EVP that before he was uh, welcoming us, right? Uh, why he should go back and say, well, I really need to follow up with those guys, right? I mean, uh, do you have that triggering event? I, I didn't really click in the triggering event. It Sorry, maybe just me. I may, I may not be the smartest guy in the room, but I'm just being very honest. It depends on the market. For instance, if I'm pitching someone in online higher education, I say, you want to offer a degree equivalent biology program. You can't presently do that because you need to bring all the students to campus for labs, and that's too expensive. We have a microscope you can mail to them that can do on-campus equivalent microbiology. It's very cheap. That would be a pitch to that person. There are other application categories that I would have different pitches for. Yes. Yes. I wanted to ask about the higher ed aspect. Mm -hmm. So um, it, I thought I heard perhaps you say uh, the lens could be adapted even to smartphones? Uh, yes, we have one prototype that couples it directly to a smartphone lens. Okay, so, and I think I just heard you say something about for these types of online courses that need these sorts of labs, how the university might send it to the student. Mm -hmm. um, is, have you also dealt with some of the publishers of those, those books that would likely go along with coursework? That seems like a market to work with. Uh, there and then why would the university or, uh, unless you're treating the university like the the bookstore where mm -hmm. you go and you buy your your tools or whatever but it might be cheap enough they could even get it on Amazon or wherever and just in anyway explain a little bit more how you envision that working so if we were to not partner with uh, say Macmillan uh, we would be most likely to sell directly to students and have it as part of a course requirement rather than going through the university. We have strongly considered partnering with textbook companies partly to reduce curricular development costs, which of course are a necessary department, uh, a necessary part of any adoption of a new device like this in the educational space. 
We are also considering developing our own curriculum and software stack in-house. So how far away do you think you are from a lab in a box? It sounds like you still need to partner with somebody from an imaging standpoint and that kind of, so I'm just curious where you think you're at from a development standpoint. We have, we have partners and in fact potential employees we're considering hiring who have the expertise to develop a full imaging stack that's suitable for educational purposes. And in fact, Chase has almost all of the necessary expertise himself. He's been working in optical programming for 15 years, Chase? Yeah. So how far we are away? I would think we could build it in roughly six months if we didn't have to consider exactly who our customers were. Part of why we're still in the search phase is because we don't know exactly which stack to build and we don't know the kind of user experience we need to offer. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Thanks very much. All right.